Welcome to the BZAC webinar. This is a webinar on how to use a compass underwater. I'm Stephen Winstanley, your presenter for the next approximate 30 minutes. What we need to think about first is a model of the Earth's surface, and this is represented by a globe. We have a North Pole and a South Pole on our globe, and the lines of magnetic flux will leave the North Pole and go all the way around the Earth in a toroidal fashion and enter back into the South Pole. What is to note is that around the equator, the lines of magnetic flux are almost parallel to the Earth's surface, while at the poles, the magnetic flux is perpendicular to the Earth's surface. What is actually happening is a little bit more complex. This is a scientific diagram of the model. And you can see that because of the complexities of the um, iron core of the Earth, the molten iron core of the Earth, you can get local variations uh, in the, uh, in the uh, magnetic flux. What we can say, however, uh, through empirical test, is that in the UK, the magnetic flux leaves the ground on a 70 degree vector. This vector can be broken down into two components, a horizontal component and a vertical component. A compass will only use the horizontal component to determine the direction of the North Pole. Why do we need to know the the fact that the magnetic flux leaves the Earth at a, an angle at 70 degrees in the UK. Well, we can look at magnetic inclination and we can look at magnetic inclination on a world map. And what we've got here um, is a map of gradients of magnetic inclination from the North Pole to the South Pole. At the North or South Pole, the inclination is 90 degrees at the north is going out of the Earth's surface and in the south, which is represented in the bottom right hand corner of this chart, is going into the Earth's surface. And the green band in the middle is where the magnetic flux is actually flowing at zero degrees, which means that it is parallel to the Earth's surface. So, well, what has that got to do with scuba diving, you may ask? Well, it is the following. Can we spot the difference? We've got two compasses here, um, and actually they are pretty well identical, except when you look at the model numbers. We can see we've got a Sunto SKH strap mount NH and a Sunto SKH map strap mount SH. This means that one is designed for the Northern Hemisphere and one is designed for the Southern Hemisphere. So compass cards are weighted to compensate for the for the Earth's inclination. Compasses can come weighted in up to seven zones. And digital dive computers that have compasses can have magnetic zone settings. So what does that mean in reality? Well, it means that if you buy a computer over the Internet, say, from Australia, um, and utilize it in the northern hemisphere, then it may not work very well because the balance of the needle has been set for the wrong hemisphere. Equally, if you um, travel on holiday, on your dive holiday, for example, with your, com with your computer, uh, equally it may not work very well on the other side of the world because it has been set for the wrong inclination. When considering compasses, one also has to consider the compass rows. What we have here is a compass rose that's taken from a nautical chart. And actually, there is two indications for north. We have a true north and we have a magnetic north. The true north is the um, axis with which the Earth spins, and it is also called the celestial north and at the top of the celestial north is the Polaris star. The challenge is, however, that inside the Earth, the metal core um, of iron 
uh, creates a magnetic north and this is not necessarily in line with the Earth's rotation. So what we also need to consider with reference to this compass rolls is that it is broken down into degrees and there is 360 degrees in the full compass rolls. North is at zero, east is at 90 degrees, south at 180 degrees and west is at 270. This particular compass rolls is broken down into increments of one degree. When we have a small device um, such as a hand burring compass which we use in diving, uh, those compasses operate in 10 degree increments. When underwater we don't really consider true north and all our navigation is done with magnetic burrings. We also have a golden rule which is left is less. So when you see the uh, numbers uh, decreasing in value that means that you're going to your left and when the compass numbers are increasing uh, it means that you're uh, that you are going to your right. We now need to consider the mechanical compass features. First of all we have a transparent oil fill body we have a magnetic north seeking compass card. We have a lubber line or direction of travel. We have a movable compass bezel. We have a gate integrated into the compass bezel. And we also have a reciprocal pin. And finally, which you can't see very clearly on this particular picture, we have a burring window. What we also need to consider is that up for dive compass features is that the compass needs to be easily read in a low visibility environment. Therefore, it needs to have high contrast numbers and a large luminescent dial in order to be able to help us with our night diving. Equally, we need to have a high degree of tilt or gimbal in so that when we are diving in turbulent waters, the mechanical compass will still be able to work um, slightly, well, slightly off horizontal. These mechanical compass types can actually work in into the order of 20 to 30 degrees from horizontal and because of that turbulent environment we do need to have good needle damping which is given to us by the transparent oil filled body. Mechanical compasses come in two types. The first type is an indirect reading compass and it has, has, has a movable compass bezel with an integrated gate. The second type is a direct reading compass and it has a fixed compass bezel with a movable gate. We call it a direct reading compass because the needle always points directly to the direction of travel. So in this particular case here, for example, is that the lubber line, which can be seen on the right hand side of the housing, uh, is actually pointing in approximately 60 degrees, which is read directly from where the compass needle is pointing. And in fact, you don't really need to use the uh, gate on the compass, and it is there simply as an aid memoir. When you look at the indirect compass, however, um, what you need to do on each occasion to get a sensible reading is to move the compass bezel around such that the uh, compass bezel's north lines up with the 
compass needle uh, compass needles north and then the direction can be indirectly read off the lubber line uh, the red line going across the center of the compass so in this particular photograph for example we're reading approximately 30 degrees both compass types um, I've labeled them here one and two <clears throat> have bearings uh, have a bearing window at the side in this particular case it's got a bearing of 210 degrees so therefore if you want to differentiate between an indirect or a direct reading compass you can look at the numbers or degrees around the bezel and they go in opposite directions taking a bearing is really simple all we need to do is to raise up our compass look over the top of the bezel at the object of interest and in this case it is the bow of a bolt from the window we see that the bearing is 211 degrees now if we were traveling along in our rib for example um, and that bearing remained at 211 degrees potentially we're on a collision course When we look at a dive computer, if it has um, a compass uh, integration, then we can also use it in the same manner as taking a compass bearing with a mechanical compass. We consider the lubber line runs through the center of the uh, computer, and this is indicating the direction south. It's also indicating the numerical value in the bottom right hand side of the screen of 180 degrees, which is the angle for south. And in this example, we're making sure that we're clear, clearing a northerly cardinal mark to the correct side. Equally, um, 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 uh, dive computers that have compass integration come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they're all read in the same sort of manner in this particular uh, case we're looking at a clearing bearing around a headland on a foggy day um, so that we can we we know what angle that we need to uh, uh, achieve uh, to get round the corner when we utilize uh, compasses like this to take a bearing uh, generally we need to have a reasonable visibility and so therefore when we're below water uh, we also want a, a reasonable visibility in order to be able to use a compass in this particular fashion because the object of interest tends to be a little distance away I will no longer consider in this particular presentation uh, digital uh, compasses uh, nor will I consider reading the bearings through the uh, mechanical compass window in the middle part of this presentation I'm going to look at using a compass I'm going to consider mounting and holding a compass I'm going to look at indirect reading compasses at the setting and orientating as well as the direct reading compasses, the setting and orientating. Mounting a compass. We have a wrist mounted com compass. Um, this is the advantage that it's in the most popular position. Um, it is streamlined. It is also easy to locate. The disadvantage is, however, that it is difficult to position correctly for navigation. We can also mount our compass on a console, for example. Uh, the advantage is, is that it's difficult to lose, easy to locate, complements the use of depth gauge to aid navigation. However, it's got disadvantages. The holes tends to be shorter than is needed, hence difficult to position for correct navigation. It promotes dangling hoses and of course it is the most expensive option. You can get a retractable shackle mounted uh, 
compass. The advantage is that it's easy to locate. It can be easy to use in the correct navigation position. Um, a buddy can easily check your compass navigation. The disadvantage is that it does require the use of hands and can dangle from your scuba gear. The, uh, the best way um, of utilizing a compass is slate mounting it. The advantage is that it promotes the most accurate technique for navigation. It records navigation and survey data. Uh, data can be shared. The disadvantage is that it does require the use of hands and can dangle. Holding a compass is very important and we need to hold it in a manner that reduces error. We mentioned in the previous slide that wrist mounted and uh, console mounted uh, compasses um, were very difficult to position correctly. This is because you need to position your compass uh, down the center line or the axis of your body. If you don't do that, you'll find that your viewing bearing of that compa compass is off center, which means that your direction of travel will be different from your viewed bearing. Hence, you will have a number of degrees of error. The correct way to hold your compass is actually to utilize both hands and you hold it directly in front of you. And that means that your body is symmetrical around the center line. So um, the influence of water, for example, through turbulence it is, is also more balanced across your body. You also viewing the burring directly down the center line of your body and in the direction of travel. This also gives you um, uh, uh, um, an improved profile when you're thinning as well. So by holding the compass directly, you greatly increase your chances of getting to your destination. OK, so now we're going to learn how to set and orientate both an indirect reading compass and a direct reading compass. We'll have a look at the indirect reading compass first. And the way we're going to do this is through a simple dive scenario. So what we're going to do is we're going to find ourselves on a rib. We're going to take that rib to a shot line and we're going to go down the shot line. The diver coxswain will tell you that one of two things. He will either say to you, well, actually, the wreck is just below the lighthouse in the distance. And so you need to go down the shot line and go in the direction of the lighthouse. Or he will say you go down the shot line and you're going you're going to go in the direction of 290 degrees magnetic, which is the same direction as the lighthouse. At this point, I'd also like to introduce reciprocal burrings. A reciprocal burring is simply um, going in the opposite direction. So you go out and then you come back um, and you'll utilize two burrings. One is your forward burring, 290 degrees, and the other one your reciprocal burring. To be able to calculate your reciprocal burring, you can add or subtract 180 degrees from the direction of travel. So if we're traveling in 290 degrees, as in this diagram, simply by subtracting 180 degrees, we find ourselves at an angle of 110 degrees magnetic. 
Going forward in the next few slides, I also just want to uh, raise your attention to, up to the left hand corner there. I've got a road traffic sign that basically says up north. Um, that is pointing to the magnetic north of the Earth. So that's how we're going to orientate ourselves around the next few slides. OK, so that's how we utilized an indirect uh, reading compass. Now we need to think about the uh, second type of compass, the direct reading compass. And we're going to apply the same dive scenario. So we've got the um, dive bolt and we've got the shot line. The dive bolt uh, skipper or the cox is going to say to you, you know, either go in the direction of the lighthouse or when you get to the bottom of the shop, go in the direction of 290 degrees magnetic. They're both the same direction. And also you may want to travel in the reciprocal bearing in order to be able to find the treasure. So let's proceed and see what the uh, see how we set and orientate a direct reading compass. OK, so what we've been just discussing is how to set and orientate a magnetic compass. And now we need to swim in the direct desired direction of travel. But the challenge we have is that we have a, a number of compass errors, and I'm going to describe four of them here. The first one is environmental effects such as metal. So when we swim near a shipwreck, for example, the compass will deviate according to the size and the magnitude of the uh, shipwreck. That variation will not be deterministic. And so we will, um, you know, it will uh, deviate by an arbitrary amount. One that we've already talked about is bad technique or incorrect holding of our compass. And equally, we could have a dominant leg kick. Your right leg could be stronger than your left leg, for example, and you may not be finning uh, quite in the direction you wish to travel. Also, you may be carrying metal items and so your dive equipment may consist of electric motors if you're using a diver propulsion vehicle or you may be utilizing lots of gas cylinders for example metal gas cylinders and that may affect your um, uh, direction on your compass setting and lastly but not least um, we also have to, to take into account current and tides and that will also generate error in our compass navigation okay so we've been talking about setting orientating a compass and we've also been looking at compass errors as well so let's put it into practice by having a practical underwater navigation exercise but first if you've not used a compass underwater presently I would recommend that you try a dry run on land. Simply find a car park and uh, create yourself a forward and reciprocal bearing and pace out a distance, not too far, um, uh, along that forward and reciprocal bearing and see if you get back to the same point. You can repeat the exercise with more complex shapes. Try a triangle. Or a square and on each side again pace out the same distance to see if you land back at the same point. Once you become familiar with your compass in a car park let's say um, now is now it's the time to go and get wet. 
I'd suggest you find a local inland quarry near where you live. The one that's near me is hap happens to be Vob's de Key. These are great sites for underwater navigation because there's lots of man-made um, uh, attractions down there and you're able to put one attraction after another in a circuit from your entry points to your exit points and you can navigate along that route. Within With an inland quarry as well, what you'll also find is that there are quite varying depths and with associated with depths you'll get different levels of visibility as well which will also test your navigation techniques. And so when you start to navigate, um, you'll need to um, start to become aware of some bearings. So let's have a look at a bearing table. Here is a bearing table from Vob's de Key. It was simply downloaded over the internet. And what you see is a list of attractions and bearings to other attractions that are near that particular attraction. So, for example, if we look in the top left hand uh, columns, we see there is a platform at six meters. And the nearby attractions are the platform at nine meters, 12 meters, 25 meters, and also the aircraft cockpit. So to read this table, you simply just say, well, I want to go from platform six to platform nine and that would be a bearing of 340 degrees. If I wanted to go in the reciprocal bearing, so from platform nine to platform six, for example, I would use a reciprocal bearing, which is 160 degrees on this table. And so this is how you use a bearing table. OK, so let's put this uh, navigation into practice. Um, what I'm defining here is a quick route round a navigation dive. So I'm selecting a number of points, which is a platform which is labelled 19 at six metres deep. Um, going to a, a bolt, which is at 20 metres deep and it is labelled six. I'm then going to a wheelhouse of a ship, which is labelled three. And then I'm going to return back to the slipway. So it's going to be a nice, easy navigation dive. So what type of things do I need to record in order to be able to facilitate that navigation dive? Well, first of all, I need to record the bearings. So I know that from these, uh, the platform labeled 19, it is 30 degrees from the bolt to the wheelhouse it is 110 degrees. And from the wheelhouse to the slip, I know that it is 200 degrees. I can also um, have an estimate of the distances. Um, I, um, from experience, I know that it's around about 50 meters from the, uh, uh, from the platform labeled 19 uh, to the bolt, uh, around, about 50, around about 50 meters from the bolt to the wheelhouse and equally um, there is about um, just under 100 meters from the wheelhouse back to the slipway. Along the route as well I would also want to record notable objects so for example when I go from the um, six meter platform to the bolt I'm going over a concrete blockhouse so I'll make a note of that. Similarly when I return from the wheelhouse label three to the slipway i'll be going over a metal railing i will then be doing some mid-water navigation over the 26 meter pit and i will then find myself against a cliff wall as i uh, approach the slipway and lastly i'll then um, aim to record some depths so what i'll do there is that um, I will note that, for example, between the bolt and the um, 
um, ship's wheelhouse, it is 20 meters deep. And what I'll use is on, on the bottom right hand corner of this slide is a uh, compass slate. And I'll write all my information down on that compass slate. OK, so we've collected um, a whole bunch of information together that's going to help us to get around a navigation uh, route or a navigation circuit. And but what we need to also recall from a few slides ago is about the uh, compass navigation errors. And we need to minimize those compass navigation errors. But what we also need to be aware of is that the area of uncertainty increases the longer the compass leg. So if we can keep our compass legs as short as possible, that means that our area of uncertainty are reduced. All divers operate in three-dimensional space. So this is X, Y, and Z space. Uh, and therefore, if we are able to control those X, Y, and Z errors, we would be able to reduce the area of uncertainty and become much more accurate with our compass navigation. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we need to do is to utilize that information that we recorded on our, our compass slate. And we know the distances um, that will reduce the length of uncertainty. So therefore, if we know that it is 50 meters or so to the bolt, then we can know that we ex need to expect a bolt in around about 50 meters time. Now, it's very difficult to measure uh, underwater and you may want to convert your meters into fin kicks or maybe even your breathing rate, for example. But, you know, there is means and methods to uh, uh, to assist you in measuring that distance. We also want to consider the Y plane, and this is the um, so this is to augment your orienteering with pilotage to reduce your sideways drift of uncertainty. And there's two ways of doing that. One is to um, uh, record your expected um, 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 features or your your expected attractions um, that you're expected to pass. So for example, going from 19 to six, we're gonna go over a concrete blockhouse, for example. From three to the slipway, we're looking for a metal handrail. And that's one type of pilotage. The other type of pilotage um, is by utilizing an underwater transit. So we can look with our eye over the top of the compass um, as we line up objects in front of us. And it could be anything from a piece of metal, in this case a cannon, uh, to rocks in order to find our treasure. There will be a, or there is a, a webinar on pilotage. So uh, go and have a look at underwater pilotage on uh, in more detail on um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, one of the other BZAC webinars. The other way of improving uncertainty is also by augmenting contour information using a depth gauge to reduce vertical uncertainty. So therefore, when you're going between the bolt, for example, and the wheelhouse, we know that it's 20 meters deep. If we start to drift into 22 meters, for example, we know we've gone a bit too far to the left because the, the, the deep quarry is to the left. Equally, if it starts to get shallow to 19 meters, for example, we know that the, um, we've gone too much to the right and we need to turn to the left slightly in order to get back onto the correct um, direction. Uh, 
And in fact, actually on that particular leg though, you probably could do away with your compass altogether and just rely on your depth gauge for navigation. When you're returning to the slipway, you also uh, may need to go into a um, mid-water navigation stretch and you'll be utilizing then your depth gauge in order to be able to maintain your accurate height to be able to cross the pit in order to be able to find the cliff on the other side. But also what you want to notice from this particular diagram is that those big orange areas that we had uh, moments ago have now greatly reduced and we find ourselves now with only small areas of uncertainty and that's because we have augmented um, uh, other uh, features and other elements of navigation and that's how we can greatly improve our quality of navigation and hence have a successful dive in order to get round a navigation circuit. Okay to summarize We've had a whistle-stop tour of how to use a compass and we've looked at a practical navigation exercise. We've looked at the uh, we've looked at mechanical and digital compasses. We've looked at different types of mechanical compass. This is the indirect reading compass and the direct reading compass. We've looked at how to mount and hold a compass. We've also looked at setting and orientating uh, both types of mechanical compass. We've also looked at compass errors and through the practical navigation exercise that we did we also looked at how we can reduce those compass errors. If you want to know a bit more about this subject of underwater navigation can I suggest that you look onto YouTube for CMAS underwater and orienteering. There you'll find a group of people who are uh, uh, navigating underwater a sport and they are taking uh, underwater navigation to the extreme and when you look at their kit configurations for example you'll be able to apply some of the principles that they're applying to your own kit in order to be able to improve your own navigation. Okay so this is where I end the presentation. I thank you very much for listening. You've been listening to Stephen Winstanley on how to use a compass.